Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Peter Robinson and this is the Ethereum Engineering Group Meetup. So today I've got Dr. Paul Ashley who's going to tell us about decentralized, decentralized IDs and the path to actually getting there and getting it to work. So Paul, why don't you introduce yourself? Sure. Thanks, Peter. Yeah. So my background is um, identity, privacy, security, that area. I've been working in that area for about mm, 30 years now. And um, about eight years ago, um, I helped start a company called Anonymy Labs, which was uh, you know, focused on privacy and, and identity and security, I guess, those three. And we have a, an office at the Gold Coast with about 50, maybe 50, between 50 and 55 software engineers. And we build a, an API platform, a platform where we build SDKs and sample apps and documentation and things for people to be able to consume a whole bunch of different um, technologies around that identity, privacy, security space um, for, the, for their application developers. And one of the areas that we've been building over the last couple of years is in the decentralized identity space, which is why I've been kind of involved in this quite a lot in the last few years. Uh, cool. That, um, yeah. And of course, you um, you started out as electronics engineering back 100 years ago. <laughs> yeah, that's, it. that's <laughs> the truth. Before PhD. <laughs> yeah, a long time ago. All right. Um, please share your slides. Okay, I will do that. Is it this one? Let's try. Can you see, all see that okay? Yep, looks awesome. Well, can I let me know when I should get going, Peter? Oh, yeah, please do. Please go ahead. Okay. So have a look at this. So this is a, a presentation that I actually gave um, recently at a conference called um, the Workshop on Blockchain, Blockchain Applications in Fintel. I was asked to do a presentation on decentralized. So it's, seen, it's a topic that's popping up all over the place as people are starting to do a lot more with you know, blockchain applications and they're looking at how they can get strong identity and what it all means. And so I was, they, they reached out to me at the workshop and said, would you mind coming and presenting on this topic? Because they knew I'd been writing papers on it for quite a long time. We've been building product in it for quite a while now. Um, and we've learned all that. <laughs> we've learned a lot about it. And it, it's not easy because it's a it's an emerging space. So you know you make a, a lot of um, wrong decisions when you're when you're working on something that's new. Um, so I call this progress and pitfalls because it is moving forward. If I was to look at now compared to 12 months ago, it's a lot further forward. And in a, in a year earlier, it was, you know, less forward as well. It was, it's, it's really grown a lot in the last two to three years um, with a lot of companies coming into this space. But let me just talk about what the presentation is. Is I, I want to I want to first talk about why we got into the decentralized identity space. And as I said, we're a privacy company, essentially. And that was the driver for us to get there. And then I want to explain, you know, what it is. And, and if, if you've been in the identity area, like I've been in identity for a long time, uh, more than 20 years, you realize we're in the, the phase three of identity management on the internet. So this is the third phase. And then I'm going to talk about some of the key components like wallets and blockchains. And by blockchain, I'm being very loose in that terminology. I'll talk a bit more about that. I want to talk about what the killer app is for decentralized identity, which is this technology called verifiable credentials. Then to look at the standards, because a lot of the work that's happening um, is in the standards um, bodies at the moment, writing standards in all sorts of different areas. And, and we're a member of, I think, three or four different standards groups um, and trying to help move this forward. And then I've got a case study at the end, if time permits, Peter, to just talk about an example project from Block. Uh, if everyone knows Square and Block, and you saw all that announcements about Web5, I was, I was going to talk a little bit about what all that meant. So let's talk about why we got into decentralized identity. So when Anonymy was created, you know, eight years ago, and, and you'll see, if you go and have a look on our website, you'll see we have this, as I said, a pseudo platform. We also have some mobile apps as well that kind of show some of this technology, but we're all about trying to help with this problem. And, you know, we started eight years ago now, and the problem was, was pretty bad then. And if you think about it now, it's much, much worse. Um, there's, you know, every, every time you go and create an account on a site somewhere, there's, you know, one of two things is going to happen. A, they're going to sell your data because they make money out of it. Doesn't matter who it is, they probably will sell it. And if 
they'd sell it, they'll probably have it stolen, right? And so in either way, all your personal information that you're putting all around the internet is being collated and stolen and passed around and shared and, and sold and all those things. And so it's, you know, you see, you see these are a lot of different examples, but we all know the case is that it's as bad as it's ever been for privacy. Um, and this, this is actually an interesting one. If you go and have a look at Pew Research, they have a, um, you know, some studies around privacy and all that. And, and I really like this picture. And, and if I go back to, you know, before Anonymy, I was actually in IBM and we had worked on a product called Tivoli Privacy Manager. I'm trying to think what the name was, Tivoli Privacy Manager. And this goes back, this is probably 10 to 15 years ago now when I worked on that product. In those days, personal information, you could kind of almost put on one hand. You know, they said it was your name and your social security number, maybe your home address. I don't even think you had mobile phones so much back then. But, you know, it was a really small set of data they considered PII or personal identifiable information. If you think about it now, every single thing you do online is uh, creates PII. It creates a trail about you. It, it could be, you know, things like your passport or your driver's license or, you know, your home address and all that. But it's just as it's just as much and you know, what have you been searching on? Where have you been going? What applications are you using? Who are you communicating with? You know, why did why did Facebook buy WhatsApp? They, they don't care about your conversations. They just want to know what your social graph is. So the thing about this slide is it's trying to say that there's hundreds of pieces of data about you that would be considered PII, and it's all open for exploitation. And, and that's what Anonymous Labs is trying to do, is trying to help with that problem. So if you, if you think about what we're trying to do as a company is we're trying to move the pendulum back and say, look, we want to make it more private for people to exist in the world. You can't go and, you know, be in, put yourself in a log cabin in, you know, in Tasmania and, and disconnect from the grid. I mean, it might sound nice, but it's not practical. So you have to live in this world of connectivity, but how do you be more private in doing it? So I just wanted to give that background because you say, well, why did you come into decentralized identity? It was because, in my opinion, decentralized identity is the most important technology for privacy for the next 10 years. So that's a big statement, but I think it is the most important technology that's coming around. So let's talk about what it is. Um, so I wanted to give, give everyone a feel for sort of how big it's been getting. Like in the last two years, I think I've seen it go from something like maybe 10 to 20 companies working in this space to probably closer to 100 companies now working in the decentralized identity space. And he's, I just wanted to go through a few examples with you just to sort of get a feel for it. So this one on the top left, probably the leading decentralized identity company in the world was a company called Ebonim. And um, recently they were port purchased by Avast. And Avast is a company like Norton or McAfee. And, and they do things like antivirus and VPN and all those kind of tradi traditional desktop security applications. They all of a sudden they bought this company called Evanim and they said, we're going to build a decentralized identity practice. So I thought, well, that's pretty big news because it's kind of way, way outside of what an Avast would normally do. On the right there, there was a um, Salesforce bought a company called Credential Master, who only allowed the creation and verification of verifiable credentials, which I'm going to talk about. But Salesforce bought that company to put that functionality, so this is decentralized identity, into the Salesforce platform. So that's, a, that's I thought that's a pretty interesting one. And then down the bottom there is an interesting one. It, there's a, a new network was set up in November, a decentralized identity network. And I'll talk about what the different ones are, but it was called Checked. And the thing that made this interesting is it was a, it was a decentralized identity network um, based on Cosmos. And it was the thing that made it different from all the other networks that had existed up to that point is it also had a token, like a checked token. So you could actually have a financial model for decentralized identity on that network. So that one was interesting, and and um, and not as anonymous labs, we help run that network by running a, a validator node on both their test and their main nets. Um, a couple of a few other ones. Um, the one on the top left is an interesting one. There's this, W3C has two big standards. One called DID or decentralized identifier. Another one called verifiable credentials. Two of the leading standards in decentralized identity space. And recently, it was a combination of Google, Apple, and Mozilla tried to stop the standardization of the DID um, standard. 
and and they they put a block in they had all these technical reasons and if you go and read and and these slides are available if you go to read those links you know evidence theory is they just don't want decentralized identity to come to fruition because a lot of these companies that exist in trading your personal information are going to have less information to trade um so that's that that's, that was another one. Another one here, a company called Ping Identity bought a company called Showcard, another decentralized identity company. So you can start to see these acquisitions happening in this space. And finally, the one at the bottom there is a pretty big one. Um, and it's a really good white paper that Square released back in November. It's, you know, it's now called Block, um, their company. And this was, the, this was the white paper and the technology that got all this press. I think it was about a month ago now where they talked about Web3 is over. It's all about Web5 now and all that stuff. That was really about this paper on this decentralized exchange. The interesting thing about it, if you go and read that white paper, about 50% of the white paper is about decentralized identity. So the whole foundation of trust in the environment, how um, users are authenticated, how they prove certain att attributes about themselves or how exchanges do is all based on decentralized identity. So I think that that's a really great white paper if you want to understand how decentralized identity can be used in a platform. Um, so that's a great one there. But what is it? Um, and I might read this one out if it's okay, Peter, because it's I, I think this is the best definition of it that's available. And, and so decentralized identity is an approach to identity and access management. And we, we've heard of identity and access management over the last 20 years, a lot of company in that space. But it's an approach that seeks to allow individuals to manage their own personally identifiable information. So it's about privacy instead of using a central authority. An important goal of decentralized identity is the creation of standards that allow internet users to control which application servers can access to specific types of PII. So, and I'm gonna talk a little bit more about it, but there's three main points about this definition that's important. One, it is an identity and access management technology. So I'm gonna talk about that next. And because I've been, as I said, in identity space for more than 20 years, and I've actually seen us go through phase one to phase two, and now we're in phase three. So it is an identity and access management technology. It is all about, every part of it is about protecting the user's personal information. It's all about, um, and all the way the protocols designed, the way everything is built is to protect the users so they have absolutely control of their identity and what um, personal information they give over, all right? Which of course, to a company like Facebook or Google, one of these is just, you know, abhorrent, you know, that a technology would even think about doing that. And the last part of it is standards. And that's really important. If you have a look at this space, there's a bunch, and I'll, I'll talk about the different standards groups, but there's a lot of standards works happening. Um, as I said, we're as anonymous, we're part of about three or four groups um, in certain areas that we think are most interesting, but there's a lot of standards work happening in this space. Um, and, 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 and so it's, it's a combination at the moment of people are building product like we are and, and a lot of standards work happening. So let's just talk about the, the models of identity access management, right? So if, if you go back to the late 90s, there was only really one identity and access management model, which is the centralized model. And a centralized model, which is still probably the most popular model out there, is you want to go and use an application. So you create an account, username, password, not use two-factor. Um, and... And, and essentially, you're creating your account or your identity on their system. Um, you give them some personal information. They give you access to the account. And quite often, they'll collect lots of personal information, as I said, and, and sell it or, or, or have it stolen. But that up to the late 90s was pretty much the only way of doing identity and access management. And then, and I'm trying to think, because I went to the, the first working group of the the SAML working group it was a secure assertion markup language, which, which produced this, the next generation of what we call federation. Um, so if you, if you have a look at, and it's probably from the late 90s to early 2000, federated identity, um, federated identity um, was really created. It's again, the second type of identity access model. Um, and if you think about what it is, it's it's what we call the social login. If you think, you know, if you go onto a site and it says, 
don't bother about creating an account, log in with Google, log in with Facebook, log in with Twitter, log in with LinkedIn. These are the federation protocols. And, and there's a few that people think about, things like SAML, OAuth, OpenID Connect. A lot, again, a lot of standards work. And it probably took 10 to 15 years from the first meeting of the SAML working group in the late 90s to really become ubiquitous on the internet, it took about 10 to 15 years. And now any site you go to, pretty much you can go either create an account or do a social login. All right. From a privacy point of view, it's absolutely terrible. It's much worse than the centralized because not only um, are you creating your account, say, on Facebook, which is bad enough and giving you personal data, but now you're telling them every site that you're going to, every time you, know, you create a new social login, they've got more information about you. You're pretty much giving all of your behavioral information back to that, what they call the identity provider. So it has this model of identity and service provider. And then we get to the topic of this talk, which is decentralized identity, which is instead of, it sort of looks like the centralized model, but the difference is you're not really creating an account in the same way. You have a wallet and a wallet is something that might live on your mobile device that has your decentralized identity. It has all your connections. It has your credentials on it. And then when you go to a site, you do what's called a peer connection. Everyone's considered a peer. Uh, uh, I see you got the three there with the federated stuff though. I mean, obviously the, First of all, obviously, the service provider has a lot less information about you, right? Um, the other thing is that early, it never really took on, but certainly with OAuth and things like that, a lot of places had, oh, you can federate with your own server yourself. Anyone, you know, you, you could run your own um, Open ID Connect um, login, and then, you know, several places would accept that. So that means that you are the, your own identity provider. It can be, but it's, it's that's, that's sort of... It not never took on. Never took on. That's, yeah, it never took on and it's not common. Um, yeah, really what I'm talking about is, is the model is mostly you go to some, one of the large identity providers, about half a dozen in the world, and you federate from them and they have they love it because they get to understand all your behaviors there yeah. in a lot of these cases in, in, in even in federation there's a lot of things you can do to be more privacy privacy you know sensitive as well but there's no <laughs> there's, there's really no incentive for those companies to want to do any of those things right so they always do the most privacy invasive way of implementing it i'll keep going peter Yes, I've ejected the person and reported them. Um, okay. How very strange! You've yes. obviously a hit a hit a you've obviously hit a high in um, people wanting to attack, which is interesting. Um, anyway, so um, just so everyone knows, um, there will be um, the waiting room enabled um, next week, which means please join before twelve thirty. Um, otherwise, I guess I'll. You know, I'll probably go in, and but you know, sometimes we miss people who um, are in the waiting room late. Anyway, so please go on. Sorry, Paul. Yeah, no worries, Peter. So, so the, the question is, is why would a user or why would a, you know, a business or government want to get into decentralized identity space? Well, to be honest, the, the, most, the main benefit is for the user. It, it's all designed about the user. So why would a user want to do it? Because they get to control their identity and they get to absolutely decide what personal information about them is exposed. Um, and, and so they have a lot more control over it. And you talk about things like selective disclosure and zero knowledge proofs and all these things are involved. But at the end of the day, what it's about is the user controlling their identity. And because if you think about when you go and create an identity on, let's say it's on Facebook, and then you federate to 20 different other sites, you really don't own that identity on Facebook at any time. They can just suspend your account or get rid of the account. And guess what happens? You now no longer can access those other 20 sites. So you're in a position of sort of relying on that identity provider. In this, you create your own identity. You have a peer connection with a site or with another person. And, and even if you decide to break that connection, they said, you're, you're off the site. I don't like what you've been saying on there, whatever. It doesn't matter. You've still got your identity in that wallet and the keys and all those things. So it doesn't, it doesn't matter as much to the user. So there's a lot of advantages for the user. But there are also advantages if you're the business or government at the other end because, you know, you, 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 I think we've probably heard of the term like web auth, the way you're trying to get 
you know, get away from username passwords and trying to use private public key cryptography, cryptography, sorry, to do authentication. Well, decentralized identity does that naturally. <clears throat> like what you do is when you create a connection, it's all based on your private public key pair and you do connections. And at any time you can go back to that site and prove who you are. So it is passwordless for users, um, which is obviously an advantage for going to a business or a government because they don't have to manage that any more. It also allows you to do end-to-end um, -end encrypted messaging. Once you have actually set up a connection with a site or another user, you sort of have this permanent connection with them. You have, they have their end of the connection, you have yours, and, they, and either party can be sending messages to each other anytime could be six months later, send you a message, and you know it came from that other party, right, because it's across this DIDCOM connection that you've established. Um, so there is an advantage there of, you know, having this long-lived connection with another party. Um, and then businesses and government can do things like issue verifiable credentials and verify them, and I'll, I'll talk about that, what, what all that means. So, but let's, I wanted to talk about now the main components of it. So... From a user's point of view, if they're working with an application that has been Just enabled, yep, sorry, Peter. Yep, well, I can see that Brandon's got his hand raised. So, Brandon, oh, do, you have a question? do you have a question there? Sorry, I didn't see that. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Thanks, appreciate that. Um, yeah, it was, it was, it was like, I guess it was a slash, it was a question slash, I guess, observation. Hmm. Uh, I guess the question is, um, let me point out the statement. The statement is you were talking about um, how you know social medias and some of the big tech giants sort of have our identity from you know from day one, right? We sign up mm -hmm. for an account with them, uh, and there's maybe there's subsidiaries of some sort. One of the things that I found out um, that wasn't very apparent, you know, when I think of like a Web one, Web two, Web three, a Web one slash Web two space where Web yep. two meaning where we're at now. Yep. Um, when you sign up for those, for instance, like if you go onto an account and says, hey, do you want to use your Google or your Facebook account? You're thinking happy days. How easy is that? I'm already signed into one of those accounts. So, yep. you know, why would I would not want to sign up for Travel Velocity with my Facebook account? That makes it easy. I don't have to go through, you know, a separate identity process and fill in all this information. And then you leave Travel Identity six months from now because or Travel whatever, you know, uh, six months from now because you don't like their service and they're spamming you for whatever reason, then boom, Facebook still has your data for anything that you do based with that company or any of their subsidiaries. And that's something that you, that's not really apparent to a lot of users. Yeah, yeah. It's, you know? you're hundred percent right. It's, it's about convenience for the user, but you're exchanging convenience for loss of privacy. So they get to learn a lot more about you and you don't really know what's being exchanged between the identity provider and service provider in both directions. Identity provider like Facebook will provide a bunch of data to the service provider who you're using and vice versa. So you don't really know what's being passed around, um, but it is its convenience uh, at the cost of privacy. It really is. Yeah, thank you for that, for adding to that. And that, so I guess that was the observation. And I guess the question is, how is that circumvented in a decentralized blockchain you know, inter uh, internet going forward, or is it? Well, in, I guess the that the federate going forward, right? If we move to decentralized identity, that's that whole idea of social login goes out the door. You don't have a social log. You don't log into Facebook to get into some new site. You have individual, more like the centralized model, individual connections with Facebook. If you happen to want a Facebook account, and to let's say it's Strava, and you want to have a Strava account, you're separate. But the difference is, is each of those is a peer connection from your decentralized identity wallet out to that site. So you're sort of getting rid of that three-way relationship and it's just single relationships, but it's all based on your wallet. You connect to them and then they can ask for information and you can decide whether or not you want to give them that information. So it's a it is a different, it's almost going back to the centralized model, but it's managed in this, what they call decentralized identity wallet, which I'm about to talk about. Okay, thanks for that. So let's talk about it because I, I wanted to say that I'm going to talk about the different pieces of a decentralized identity. And, and from a user's point of view, the way they see the decentralized identity world is through their wallet. So I just put this up and in, in, in one of the things we're doing at Anonymy is we're building wallet. Um, and But I, I've decided just to pick one that was it's sort of almost like an open source one that's out on um, in Europe called Lissy. 
and it, it's and I've just got some screenshots from that app. But what um, there's there's probably about six to ten of these decentralized identity wallets out there now. Um, and and if you if you start on the left there, this is what a user would see. So anytime you want to make a connection, and I said if you could make a connection between yourself and another user, so Peter and I could connect. Um, over a DidCom connection, and that connection would exist um, on that first screen. What are the trusted connections? Or it could be myself to a, a some sort of website or something, and I want to connect to them, and there would be another connection for there. So everything's based on connections. Some people call them sort of like, it's almost like your address book because each of those are contacts that you have, whether it's users or sites, and that's that's what's on that left one. The second one is credentials. And, and I think this, the power of decentralized identity is these credentials. And these credentials could be electronic driver's license, electronic passport, could be your gym pass. It could be anything where you you'd normally carry sort of a physical credential instead of you get an electronic credential. And, you know, it's all cryptographically protected. It's, it's issued by an issuer. It's validated by a, kind of valid, a validator or a verifier. And you hold those credentials in your wallet. And there's a whole presentation protocol I'm going to talk about about those. So that's the second thing that a user would see. These are the credentials that I've been issued. The next one is what, what I would call the um, selective disclosure. So when you go to a site and make a connection with them, they might say, look, I want your phone number, your email address, your home, you know, your home address, whatever. And that would come up on your wallet screen. And then you will decide, yes, I'll let you have my email address and phone number, but I'm not giving you my home address and then respond. And there's a bit of a protocol about that. So that's why you have a lot better control over your personal data. You can really control what it is that you present to them. And then the last one is just some activities. So for example, you get issued a credential and then you wanna be able to have an activity list of, oh, yeah, I got issued it on this date, let's say it's my driver's license and I presented it at these different places, um, usually online, but it could also be in person because you could turn up with your wallet, with your phone, sorry, and, um, and, and do a connection you know, in person as well. So that's really the heart for a user, the heart of decentralized identity is this wallet technology. And, and as I said, there's probably six to 10 out there now that you can play with. And they're all pretty much the same. Like it doesn't matter which ones you go to, they, they sort of have their kind of sort of fundamental um, features in them. So we've been working on wallets for a while now and, and building them. And, and you learn a lot about what the problems are. And one of the problems is in its, I guess it's the same problem you have with a, a crypto wallet is where do you put your keys? Now, if you have a look at all the decentralized identity wallets out there, they're all mobile applications. I've not yet found a single sort of decentralized identity browser extension yet for to doing it in a browser. So they're all mobile apps and, and our Anonymy is building both an iOS and Android mobile app as well. Um, because you need somewhere to store these set of keys and connections and credentials and all that in a really safe place. Um, so mobile is a, is a natural place for an identity wallet. Um, if you do a web, and you know we may do a web, where do the where do the wallets go? Where do the keys go? Do you have to put them on a cloud service? Do you have to upload them into the you know the, and all the problems? And you know, and I've used you know I use like you know, web-based crypto wallets and that, and we know some of the security issues around that. So that's one of the decentralized identity has all the same issues as where do you put all these you know these um, really important things like private keys and these digital credentials. You don't want them people to lift them up and then start impersonating you. So that, the whole key management is a, is a problem. The next is ease of use. How do you make your wallet really easily used by a normal? Most of the people that are using those, and there's a bunch of projects, there's probably 20 projects around the world in decentralized identity at the moment. Um, and you know, how do they design those wallets to be really simple for a user to use so they actually know what it means to have a connection and a credential and, and look at activities and things like that? That's not that easy. So you've got to put a lot of work into in terms of the design of these wallets. And the last thing is, is they're incredibly complex. The protocols, so they when I say AIP 1.0 and AIP 2.0, that stands for Aries Interop Protocol. An identity wallet is really two pieces: it's the storage where you put your credentials and your keys and all that. And then you've got your interactions, what they call the agent side of it. That's why um, it, that's the why they call it Aries Interop Protocol. But we're talking, there's probably at least 20 RFCs for different protocols within Aries 1.0, and there's equivalent number for 2.0. And so as an 
and implement it. So we're implementing a wallet at the moment, building an agent and all those things. You've got to go, which, which protocols do I do? Do I do the 1.0? Do I do the 2.0? Which one's out of the 20 do I do? Maybe I'll just do these five. So it's actually a very complex thing to build an identity wallet because, you know, to do things like I need to connect to a site and go through a connection protocol, and then they want to be able to issue me a, um, a verifiable credential. So there's an issuing protocol. I want to present what's called a presentation proof you know, using my wallet, that's a presentation protocol. So there's all these protocols that you've got to implement in the wallet. There's pretty complex. So um, they look simple, but they're not simple. And so that's one of the, the one of the things we've found. As I said, we've been building product in this space for a couple of years and, and building an identity wallet is really complex. But the thing about the identity wallet is probably something you give away for free because it's like a browser and probably just as complex. Now let's talk about the blockchain side of it, right? So what I get asked to do this presentation originally, you know, at this blockchain um, workshop, it was because people are seeing decentralized identity in the, in the blockchain applications a lot. But in this case, I'm actually talking about decentralizations, decentralized identity use of the blockchain. Although I'm being very loose here with my terminology, it's probably more like a ledger than a blockchain, um, but I'll talk about that. So... The, when you've got a decentralized identity application or network or something, right, the, the, the source of trust for that environment is what they call a verifiable data registry, right? So this is where you do things like store public keys, put schemas, put what they call credential definitions and all these. They sit on some sort of verifiable data registry. And that could be a blockchain, a Bitcoin-based one. If you look at Microsoft, they've got a, a network called ION. Um, which is based on Bitcoin. If you have a look at some of the other popular ones, they're based on things called Hyperledger India. It's more like a ledger network, but there's all sorts of ones, and I'll show you some of the ones that are around. But the 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 you know the core identifier for a person or a server or an issuer of a credential is this thing called a DID, a decentralized identifier, and it's a spec about those. Those usually, at least for things like issuers, they get written to some sort of ledger or blockchain. Um, and you'll see that when I show you the verifiable credential protocol. How do you know what to write to these ledgers or these blockchains? It's described in a document called a DID method. So if you're the ION, you'll see there's a DID colon ION, which is a document. It's the DID ION is the DID method name. And there's a document that says these are all the things if you want to do an application and you want to back it up by the ION network, here's all of the data you need to put onto the, the ledger or the blockchain. That's what the DID method is. Um, and, and, and there's more things. So on the, on the right there, you'll see I've got a few, a few listed. I've got Hyperledger Indie. So in Anonymy, we help run two different Hyperledger Indie networks, decentralized identity networks, one called Sovereign and another one called Indicio. You say, what does that mean to help run the networks? Just like a miner, we run validator nodes on those networks. So Hyperledger Indy typically has 24 validators on the network and implement this consensus protocol. And we run um, on the, at the moment, we're running on the sovereign um, staging net, which is kind of the middle one. They've got, they've got sort of a, a, dev, a dev environment, a test environment, and a prod environment. So we're running a validator node on their test environment. And on DCO, we run it on their main net. So they're both Hyperledger Indie nodes. Um, we also run a validator node on the testnet and mainnet of the Czech network. That's the new one, um, which is a Cosmos-based network. Um, so I'll talk a little bit more about that. But there's different technologies. In, and in some ways, for an application developer who wants to use decentralized identity, it doesn't matter because as long as you follow the rules of the DID method about what you need to write to operate on that network. There's more than, if you actually go to this site, and I said I'll make these slides available and you can go to those links, there's more than 100 different DID methods being published. The most popular is Hyperledger Indie. You know, a lot of the projects out there are backed by Hyperledger Indie networks, but there's Ethereum ones, there's Bitcoins, there's IPFS, there's Hyperledger Fabric, all sorts of technologies for implementing a decentralized identity network. Um, as I said, if I, if I looked a year ago, I think there was about 70 and then I looked you know, a few weeks ago and it's like 120 now. So people are adding more networks and different varieties all the time. And, if, you know, and over time, you know, a lot of those aren't being used anymore and they'll probably drop off. But you know, you, maybe in time we'll have three or four or five different technologies that are the core technologies for decentralized identity networks.
I wanted to talk about this one. So as I said, did when you go, when you see did colon something, that's the method name. So did indie method. So this is a new one. This was only published in May this year. And what it was to, the reason why they published a did method called did indie is there was about a dozen hyperledger indie decentralized identity networks out there because what they didn't they didn't talk to each other they're all a bit different there was a did solve and a did indicio and a did this they're all these ones they're all using the same underlying technology called hyperledger indie but they the way you the, the actual did methods for each of them were different so there was a project that was picked off by the Canadian government to say, let's create a, a did indie method for standardizing access to any Hyperledger indie based network. And that's what this was created. Um, and it talks about what a Hyperledger indie network is, and it uses this RBFT consensus protocol, and it's all centrally governed. And, and what, it, what it means centrally governed, like if you work on a sovereign network like we do, you have to actually get sent out PDF forms that says, here's the rules of being a validator and you have to sign them and you send those forms back. And, um, and if you want to write to the network, you've got to become an endorser and, 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 and follow the endorser agreement. So you sign your endorser agreement and send that. So it's kind of a centralised, real-world, paper-based governance model, which you'll see is different in the next one. Um, to write to these networks, like if we want to write to an Indicio network or a sovereign network, we spend about, you have to spend about 5,000 a year US dollars to get access to that. Endorsers have to pay that every year to be able to write whatever they like to the network, but um, it does cost real money. Um, and except because they don't have a, they don't have their own token. Um, dids look like what's on there. Yes, a did will be something like that did indie means um, they, that's the, um, the did method, sovereign, which is the sovereign network, staging, as I said, is their middle one, and then you've got a did, and that might be an, uh, a verifiable credential issue a did, and that's their identifier. They will have a private key. If you go to that address and read the did doc, you'll be able to get their public key, their endpoint, and other information about that. So just say it was an issue about that issuer. Um, and there's a whole bunch of information you write to that network, things like for verifiable credentials, they, they implement this thing called a non creds and I'll talk about that. But there's you have to write a schema, a credentialed issuer, a credential definition, an issuer did. If you want to do revocation of credentials, you've got to write, you've got to create these registration definitions and entries. So it will, again, what that method does is just a document you can read. You go and read it. It's actually pretty interesting reading the did method and just talks about how the network works and what you need to write to it to, to operate it in the way they want you to operate it. There's another one called Did Checked. As I said, we help run a, a node on both the testnet and the main network with this check network. Um, they, they initially said they wanted to baseline how their network actually operated in terms of the interfaces, the same as Hyperledger Indy. But over time, I think it's, it's sort of moving away from it. Um, they use, it's Tendermint, it's Cosmos network, these Tendermint um, protocols for consensus. And it's, it's a true decentralized governance network. So, you know, people electronically put up a proposal for governance, like I want to do an upgrade of the network and then people vote on it. And if it passes, then, um, then that will go forward. So it's a totally different style to the Hyperledger Indie networks. And it does have an economic model, which is why I want to show this is it has a check token. So you can get a check token. And as a validator on these networks, we get paid check tokens. And as, when we want to write stuff to those networks, then we can spend those check tokens. So they have this token that allows this financial model on the check network. Um, and, and their did method is something like did checked, which is a did method, their main net, and then the identifier on there. That makes sense. So that could be, again, an issuer sitting on the, the check, net, check network. Um, and 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 this is actually not quite right. Where I said for, they they've just they've actually just released code for their verifiable credentials, and so I said yet to be implemented, which is a little bit out of date now, maybe a couple of weeks out of date, um, because they're now starting to define how you write things like schemas and credential definitions and did things onto their networks. Um, so it's a newer network. It's probably Hyperledger Indie could be as old as five years old now, whereas the Czech network I think was only created in November last year. But you can see that it has a lot of sort of more modern thinking around it. So what are the hurdles with verifiable data registry? And I've kind of hinted a bit about this, which is why they created the, the did indie method. The biggest issue is interoperability. If I'm an issuer and I'm sitting on the Microsoft ION network, 
and I want to issue a credential and the, the verifier sitting on the, you know, it's, it's used to sitting on the, um, I don't know, the sovereign network and inter interact with that, it becomes interop interoperability question, you know, like can those two systems interoper interoperate with each other and do they know how to work together? So I think that's probably, you know, eventually, hopefully there'll be a did VDR, so they all work the same, but at the moment, um, they haven't got to that and there's a whole lot of different did methods and what I think will happen over the years is they will close up to maybe one or two or three you know of the important did methods to, because if you don't if if every network's different then you've got to write code to code to support every network and so that's the interoperability problem and we're already seeing that we checked and in Indy is that you have to write code to be able to write the right information to the Indy network and you have to write code to write the right information to the check network so it's already like, well, then what happens when the third one comes along? Okay, so that's just, that's the trust, that, that's the trust layer of the decentralized identity applications is, is as I said, a blockchain or a, uh, or a ledger. But what is the killer application? Why is it important? Like you're saying like, I don't know, why is it important? Well, I think it's important because of verifiable credentials. Um, so what is a verifiable credential? It's, it's just a cryptographically protected, you know, block of data. And the idea is, is anything that you had on a plastic, like a driver's license, your passport, you know, if you think about your wallet, you've got Medicare cards and you might have a Booper card and you might have a gym card and all those cards, right? It's much easier if they're electronic, they're living in a wallet on your device. Um, and so this is why verifiable credentials was invented. But I would say it's the most sophisticated credentialing system there is and, and the most privacy preserving. And I'll show you in that some of the some of the things why I say that. So this is this is the verifiable credential, um, I guess, you know, the, the full kind of life cycle of it. You start over on the left as an issuer. And, and let's take an example. Queensland Transport have decided that they want to issue an electronic driver's license to you. So when you go and pick up your plastic one, they want to give you an electronic one. And so you can put it in your wallet on your mobile device, right? So you've got both an electronic and a plastic one. So they become an issuer. So Queensland Transport would be the issuer. The first thing they have to do is write to the verifiable data registry. Again, that's the ledger or the blockchain down the bottom there. They have to write things like what's their did, the issuer did, so people can go and find out um, their public key, their endpoint. Um, they will also write the schema of that driver's license to it and what's called a cred def which is a credential definition, which, which kind of links the issuer did and that schema together. So you know I'm getting 1.0 version of the driver's license. Next, in six months, they might update it to add another field, so it becomes the 1.2 version. So you have to write that stuff to the blockchain. And that's, that's why this is the, the foundation of trust is that blockchain or that ledger on the bottom there. Okay, so then you walk into Queensland Transport and say, look, oh, it's time to renew my license. And they go, okay, pay your money here, you do that. Here, take, take your photo, here's your plastic one, and give us your phone. And you'll we'll bring it, put your phone up to that, um, that device over there. And then you will connect to them with that connection protocol or DIDCOM connection. They will issue into your wallet this verifiable credential, which is this digital driver's license and cryptographically protected. And that sits in your wallet and you become what's called the holder of that credential. And then later on, let's say you're shopping online and you want to buy some alcohol online, it says, oh, you need to prove you're over 18. So again, you do a connection um, to that site and you then present that credential to the verifier, which could be, you know, could be the liquor store that you're, you're, you're presenting it to. The, and this is where some of the privacy enhancements are. The first thing is, is the verifier can check um, the integrity of that um, that credential and that they know that it hasn't been altered, they know that it hasn't been revoked, like they know it's whether it's been revoked or not, without ever talking back to the issuer. So Queensland Transport never needs to know that, you know, that every week you, you, you buy some alcohol online, right? The verifier can verify that credential without ever going back to the issuer. So that's one point of privacy. The second is that protocol between the data wallet and the verifier is what they call a presentation proof. And there's three different varieties. One is show me your credential, show me your driver's license, like, you know, as you do when you walk into those stores, here's your driver's license. The second is what they call partial disclosure. Just show me your name and show me your birthday. 
That's what they call partial disclosure. So you can do that from your credential without showing any of the other characteristics. They don't need to know you've got blue eyes. They don't need to know that you're registered to drive a truck or that you wear glasses. They don't need to know that. You can do selective disclosure where they say, just tell me these two things. And they might say, tell me these five things. And you say, no, I'm only going to tell you these two things because that's all you need to know. So that's what they call selective disclosure. Or the most privacy preserving is obviously a zero knowledge proof where you can prove that you're over 18 without ever giving your birth date, right? And so it does that as well. So those are some of the characteristics that allow verified credentials to be much more privacy sensitive than anything else that, that's come before then. And the verifier, the way the verifier can check that credential information presented is valid is because they go back to the verifiable data registry, the blockchain, and look at things like the issuer did, the schema, the credential definition, and they can understand what's happening there. So it's it really is the killer application for decentralized identity, and it's why you see projects all around the world. Um, there's, there's lots of projects in Europe around digital passports, digital driver's license, vaccine certificates, you know, for going on to airlines and all sorts of different projects. So I would say it's at the stage now that there's probably 20 large projects around the world all using credentials in some way to kind of make it more efficient to do whatever thing that they're trying to do. So because like one, one good example is if you, you know, if you get issued a driver's license, a plastic one, and next week you get caught drink driving, they cancel your license, right? You can still go hold that plastic driver's license and turn up somewhere and show it. And they don't know that it's been revoked. The advantage of the digital version is you know immediately when you go to present it that it's been revoked. And um, that's one of the advantage of the system. Um, I won't go through this in any, any data because you can go and read these slides. But one of the things I said about the check network, which is unique in decentralized identity, is it has this economic model, right? It has a check token and validators get paid check. When you write to the network, you've got a spend check. And also you can, you, there's actually a financial model around verifiable credentials. And there's three models. One is holder pays issuer. So you've actually paid for that digital credential. There's another one um, where the, um, the verifier, I think is, is paying the holder. Um, and that's, that's another model. And then you've got the verifier paying the issuer. And there's different reasons why you would use the different models. This, this, this last one here is an interesting one. So let's suppose you go to a bank and you do your you know, 100 point check, right? That's an expensive process for the bank. It's really annoying for the human. And so what should happen is that bank should issue you a verifiable credential for your wallet that says, you know, you've been identity verified. When you go to the next bank, you should just present that credential. When you do that, you're saving that second bank hundreds of dollars in terms of identity verification. So they should then go and pay the original issuer of that verifiable credential. So this is why Checked has this, um, this economic model, the three different varieties of it, but it's to make, make it economically viable for, to be an issuer and then also to be a, a verifier and a holder. Okay. Question. Their question, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so that's that's a very interesting one. If you can go back a slide, just yep, this one. visual. Yeah, so, um, so one of the things that I've been, I guess, patiently waiting to see come onto the blockchain is uh, a use case where, and, and I was thinking of this model, but the use case was um, medical records. For instance, you go to your GP and the GP says, go to a specialist. In today's modern society, in most first world countries, uh, you go to that, that uh, specialist and it could take days or weeks to get your medical records transferred, validated and all that. All those things, yep. And this would solve for that, wouldn't it? It would. And in fact, medical in the US, medical is one of the kind of chief, let's say, um, proto prototyping type projects that is happening at the moment because of that exact thing is you should be able to be issued a credential that maybe has your um, some medical information about you and you should be able to present it and they know who issued it. They, they know that it hasn't been altered and all those things. So verifiable credentials for medical records has been talked about a lot. Yep. Okay, good. Yeah. And then again, you know, if you're if you're the you know the producer of those medical records and you've been seeing the patient and creating these records and then you issue them with a, a credential, like that's an example of where the, the verifier maybe pays the issuer some money because they're like, well, you've you've saved me a whole lot of information. You haven't had to curry over a sack of paper and all that. Immediately, you can get all your medical information out of a credential. Yeah, 
Um, and, and the advantage is, is that the user holds that too. So the user is the intermediary way. So you present you present your credential, you know, the medical records to the user and the user presents it to the specialist and they can take it in. So it, it is in the control of the user. It's the same thing with, with finance and, um, you know, mortgages and buying homes and things like that. All, all of those use cases, there's lots of them where this is a really, this is why I think this is the killer app for decentralized um, identity. Mm -hmm. Uh, so what's the, what's the hurdle? So in every one of these ones, I'm saying the progress, we're making progress. This is a great, like if you go and read your non-cred specification, you know, the thing that comes across is this stuff's really well designed and it's really well designed in, in a privacy sense. Um, but there's already interoperability problems. Why? Because there's the non-cred spec, which is the anonymous credential specification is one type of credential. And then you've got the W3C verifiable credential spec, which is a different specification. And so as a holder, <laughs> or an issuer, do I have to issue both types? Do I have to be able to allow a company to pick type A or type B? Or do I, and my wallets, do I have to accept both types and all that? So again, it's this interoperability problem in there. And I guess as we this develop, these will come, go away. But at the moment, you've got this problem of, do I have to support both specifications? Um, and and we'll, I guess we'll see who, who wins that war. So let's talk about the standards. And I said, there's a lot of work in the standards. So anonymous labs, we're a member of W3C, we're a member of DIFF, we're a member of the Linux Foundation. Under W3C, as I said, there's two different key standards, one called DID and one called the W3C credentials that I showed in that previous slide. DIFF is, it stands for the Decentralized Identity Foundation. There's about a dozen working groups in there that do things like standardize things like wallets, and, and DIDCOM is standardized in there. So there's a whole lot of working groups within DIFF which are producing both specs and you know, code implementations. Um, Linux Foundation is the home to Hyperledger. You know, there's all sorts of blockchain type projects within the Linux Foundation under that Hyperledger brand. Um, and that's where Hyperledger Indy comes from, Hyperledger Ares, when I talk about Ares Interop Protocol, that's all under Hyperledger. And there's another one called Hyperledger Ursa which is all part of the, the cryptography that's used in this environment. And then under Linux Foundation, there's also another group that we're a member of called the Trust Over IP Foundation, which is trying to bring all of these specs together into a kind of a TCP IP style layered stack where you have, you know, it's a four layered model and down the bottom is you have your ledgers and your blockchains and the next layer up, you have your DIDCOM connections. And the one above that is your credentials. The one about that is the applications and it talks about what happens in each of those layers. So there is a lot of work happening in these, in this specific, in this kind of the standards, um, standards area and we're we're part of it but you know we can only be part of a little bit of it because there's just a lot of them there's a lot of working groups out there okay have i got time peter to cover this or would you want me to wrap up and open up the questions no i think um, go through the case study because the case study will help crystallize um the whole talk i think yeah, and so this is really interesting. So there was, I don't know, it was it two weeks ago, four weeks ago, probably maybe four weeks ago, there was all these tweets that went around and it was it was from Jack Dorsey and it was and Web3 is dead, Web3 is over, it's Web5 now. And this is what he was talking about. He was talking about this project called TBDEX. Um, and 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 it's a good and, and I I didn't come to it from that point of view. Like I I I, I saw this about six months ago, but I thought it was a really good case study of why decentralized identity was important because it's the foundation of trust in this um, exchange protocol. So the, the whole idea here is, is TBDEX is a protocol for an exchange, right? So it could be exchanging cryptocurrencies, cryptocurrencies to fiat money, real world goods, or whatever on this exchange. And, there, and really early in the specification, it talks about this need for social trust. And I'm like thinking, what's social trust? Well, what it means is, depending on the transaction, you may have to prove something about yourself as the transactor. Um, and typically, the thing you have to prove is your identity. So you need to have some identity verification. For example, if you're transferring between anything and fiat money, like cryptocurrency to fiat money, some government somewhere is going to want to know that they know who you are. All right. So that's what they call social trust. And the interesting thing about it is it says, well, the way we do social trust in this network is using decentralized identity. And you they talk about DIDs and verifiable credentials to establish, and this is their terminology, the province 
provenance of identity in the real world. So the idea here is, is that if you want to, you know, use this um, exchange, in some transactions, they don't care. You can be anonymous. You can say, I want to do this exchange and, ex and someone will reply and say, yeah, I can help you do that transfer. And I don't care who you are, I'll just do it for you. Other ones are going to say, no, nah, you're going to have to present some identity verification to us. And this is why they took on decentralized identity because they go, oh, we can, the person can um, submit a verifiable credential to us, presentable credential. Um, and so they, they have this term called PFI, participating financial institutions, which could be banks or fintech companies or startups or whatever, but it's anyone that's willing to partake in this exchange and being part of this exchange. So you've got to implement the protocols um, and follow the rules, and then you can kind of join this network and be part of this exchange. Where did decentralized identity come into it? Well, they needed a layer in there that you could identify users, you could identify those PFIs um, and credential issuers on the networks as well. So, the, you know, DIDs, everyone has a wallet, whether you're a user or a PFI or a credential issuer or whatever, you'll have a wallet, you'll have a DID, you create them onto the, um, on the blockchain or the, or the network. In this case, it is a blockchain, it's Bitcoin um, based. Um, and then it says, well, when you want to prove your identity or assert things about your identity, use verifiable credentials. Um, and they also allow users to issue verifiable credentials, which actually give ratings to PFIs. So if you have a bad experience with one of those uh, PFIs, then you can say, look, I give them three out of 10 and you can issue yourself a credential and, 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 and give it to someone else. Um, and it also has a, an economic model in there for those credential issuers. The idea is, is you go over to a, an identity verifier and it says, look, I need your photo, I need your driver's license, your passport, whatever they need about you. And then they issue with your credential into your wallet. And then at the time of doing a transaction that requires an identity verification, then you can present that credential. So the PFI doesn't have to verify you. They can use this credential from others, some other identity verifier. And, and so people in, in this exchange have identity wallets that have key pairs and dids in the, in the normal decentralized way. They can request credentials, they can hold them and they can present them depending on the transaction. Um, they, as I said, they can create credentials and they can sign and store transactions within their wallet as well. And it has this other concept in decentralized identity, which I haven't talked about because it's not universally accepted as part of DI, which is these things called identity hubs. And Identity Hubs is, is kind of this cloud-based service where you can put personal information and make that personal information available to other services um, in, a, in a controlled way. But I didn't really talk about it in this presentation because it's not universally accepted as being part of the, the decentralized identity canon, you might say. But how does it work, right? So it, as a user, you say, I want to do to the network, you say, I want to do a transaction. I want to exchange from this product, this this cryptocurrency to this cryptocurrency, right? And you put it up to the network and the network will get responses. And this, this one will say, well, that's going to cost you two cents. This one's going to say it's going to cost you 10 cents. Um, and, and then you decide which one you want to go through. And you might say, well, the two cent one's cheap, but they've got a really bad rating. I'd rather pay the 10 cents and make sure this actually happens. And so it, it, it's kind of this bid protocol to say, I want to do this and I'll come back and say to you, um, you know, how much it's going to cost, for example. The other thing they can say is, I can do it, but you need to present this credential to me and you know, of this standard that says these things about you. Maybe it has to prove your name and your home address or your tax file number or whatever it is that they say. So they can say back to the user, yeah, I'll do it for 10 cents, but at the same time, you need to present a credential to me with verification. And, and that's where, again, the decentralized identity comes in because it expects you to present a W3C verifiable credential to them. That has been signed by, say, an issuer that, that's, to say, a known identity verifier. And that's, that's where it comes in. So you could say this whole network and, you know, you could go and join the network and help do these trades and things. But underneath it, you could say the identity layer for this network is the decentralized identity. And actually I've seen this a lot in Web3 articles. They're saying decentralized identity will be the identity layer for Web3 in these environments. So we'll see. Um, so my conclusions, Peter. Uh, and, and so I, I went back to the start, right? Why did we get into it? And it, it's because the surveillance economy is not getting any better and you need to improve things for normal users, which is why we're in this space. Why was decentralized identity 
thought of, built? Why is it being standardized? It's a lot about that. It is about the user having control of their identity and their personal information and only giving across what they feel comfortable for the transaction or for whatever they're trying to do. The anchor of trust, and this is why it's actually also the killer app for blockchains or, or ledgers, is you can't do these things with decentralized identity without some source of trust. You have to have a Bitcoin network or a Hyperledger Indie network or a Cosmos network, one of these immutable networks behind the scenes that is the anchor of trust. The whole thing falls down without it. So it's why it is you know, a, a, one of the killer apps for this sort of technology. And, and, and then the final point is there has been a huge amount of progress, especially in the last two years in this space across the standards groups in terms of product, in all these sort of areas in terms of projects. But there's still a lot of pitfalls, a lot of interoperability problems, a lot of hard things to build that, you know, we've been building for about a year and a half to two years now. And we're only getting to the point now of actually having product that we can take to a customer because it takes a lot of work. It's actually quite heavy to build technology for this environment. And I think that's about it, Peter. I think I might be done there. Oh, did you want to talk about the future talks or do you want to open up to questions? I reckon let, let's do questions now and then I'll... Oh, no, no, let, I'll do the future talks because um, that's only a few seconds and then okay. we'll flip questions. Okay. So there are a stack of talks coming up. I guess that's the short term, short way of looking at it. But um, in two weeks' time, um, Jakob Gillum is um, who's the um, chief scientist at Chainalysis is going to come on and talk about how Chainalysis works. So that should be super interesting. We've got um, the Lachlan is going to talk about his PhD um, thesis, which is around socio-legal aspects of blockchain. We've got Ermius talking about cross-chain security. So that one's been delayed a bit, but then it's, it's going to happen there in late October. And then after that, there's a whole stack of talks, including me talking about Solidity in Line Assembler, which a few people have asked about. So, yep. And then if you flip to the next slide, um, if there is a next slide, or yep, there we go. So there's the YouTube channel and the meetup group. So just uh, for those of you who were have been on the call the whole way through, you might have noticed that we had some, I don't know, cyber attacks, I'm idiot. So from now on, um, if everyone can please join the actual meetup, um, make sure the name that they're using on the meetup represents their real name and make sure there's, their ID in Zoom matches that name. So if you join late, um, you'll be in the waiting room. And if I can't identify who you are, then I'm not going to let you in. Um, it's a simple filtering process. Um, the Zoom link that we use for the subsequent meetings is going to change as well. So um, actually use the link that's in the meetup the day before, you know, on the day of um, the meeting. So that's going to change um, sometime in the next few days. Um, so anyway, enough from me and back over to everyone to ask Paul some tricky questions. Yes, thank you. <laughs> and I no promises that I'll know the answer, but anyway, I'll try. <laughs> what questions are there? I suppose the big um, kind of obvious one, um, many people don't care about privacy and um, mm. they just care about the convenience and this is not the first rodeo uh, around um i remember a long time ago microsoft had their card space which was windows will run yep. through a wall on your computer yep. for you and it will just talk automatically to your websites and um and windows got a very big user base but that never never took off or what else we have before open id was originally meant to be a federated one where you could run your own. And, and for many years, I used Stack Overflow redirecting to my own open ID provider. But I think they put up a graph of why they discontinued support for it a few years ago. And now there are millions of users that had hundreds of thousands of inactive open ID connects and like 13,000 active ones. Um, so, so, so why would users take this up is the question maybe? Yeah, yeah. But look, it's, it's, I think that's the, the obvious thing is... It, is is how, how do you i mean yeah what, and, and what, what, i think there's i think there's a couple of answers to that right one is it will be more convenient for them so for example you know um having a driver's license that's sitting on your mobile device i don't have to carry a wallet with the driver's license and show that 
is an advantage having like an electronic version. And so I think users will see it as an advantage and you'll say, well, then they have to have an identity wallet app. Well, maybe not because if you have a look at example, the Apple wallet, all right, a lot of their announcements lately sound very decentralized identity like in terms of being able to get credentials onto their wallet and things like that. So I think there'll be a time where it will actually be very convenient for a user. They'll just turn up with their phone. They'll get a driver's license put onto their Apple wallet maybe, or maybe they'll have an app like, like we're producing an app for it. Um, and, and it will actually be convenient for the user to do that, especially around these credentials. Um, and, and so one, one is it will be convenient. Another is if you have a look at some of the projects that are happening in the airline world and things like that, Users may just have to do it because they want to have things like electronic visas, electronic passports, electronic vaccine certificates, all those things. It is much quicker for the airport and the airlines to, if you've got it on the phone and you can just present it and move quickly through, then, you know, you pull out your vaccine paper and you pull out this visa and they have to look them through that document. So I think there would be a lot of advantages in terms of, you know, being, I think it'd be advantage for the user and also for companies will go, look, I just, we just have to change this because it's a much easier way of, of working. So I, I'm sort of confident around decentralized identity mainly because of the credential space, because I can see some real conveniences around the credentials. And, and the fact that people like Apple in their, their latest, you'd look at their latest announcements, you think, gee, that sounds a lot like decentralized identity and credentials going into their wallets. Next question. Uh, so just in terms of the data storage itself, mm. sorry, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Yep. Sure can. Oh, I just lost them, I think. I was going to say sure could. I could, yeah, just for the beginning, yeah. yeah. Aiden, you've, you, when you asked, can we hear you, we heard you, and then you dropped out. Maybe, oh, okay, sorry. Oh, no, um, no, you're back. So you're back. just in terms of the data storage itself, yep. Um, is, is the, the data actually, so clearly the data itself is just not held unencrypted on the registry, but um, is like the other claims in the, the, the data, like the credentials metadata held on the registry and then encrypted somehow with the, um, yeah. so the private key or something held by the, the user's decentralized identity wallet or? Yeah, so, so, so the, the, there's very little that's actually put onto the verifiable data registry on the blockchain or the ledger. There's very little data that's put there. If you're an issuer and you're like Queensland Transport, and you're issuing digital driver's licenses. The only thing that you write is your issuer did, right, if it has your public key and endpoint. You write your... Um, schema which would be the schema of the driver's license and it might say there's 20 fields and this one's you know char 20 and this one's whatever this is a photo or an image so you write your schema and they write what's called a cred def a cred credential definition which is the linkage between uh, the schema and the um, the issuer did and of course you might have to add new data as you bring new versions of the schema or if you want to change your did into something else but there's not a lot of data that actually goes onto the verifiable um, data registry on the blockchain. Um, most of the data is actually living in your wallet. So you, when you go and create your DID, you go into your wallet and say, I want to create myself a DID. And what it does, it creates a private public key pair, usually elliptic curve cryptography. The popular one is, you know, like it's EC24519. And so you've created this private public key pair in your wallet. Um, if you want to then write that user did to um, to a, a registry, then it would the, the wallet would write out to the, the registry and said, you know, this is essentially here's my did, and you write a did doc, which has the public key and the endpoint, and then you maybe you email it to people to say that's my did that's out on there. But there's not a lot of data on on the actual blockchain um, because the things like your key pair, your did. And any credentials that are issued go into your wallet. They don't go onto the blockchain. There's no, there's no credential on the blockchain. The only thing that goes on the blockchain related to credentials is if um, they want to do revocation. So if Queensland Transport says, look, I want verifiers to know whether this drives license being revoked, then information does go on the blockchain to help them understand whether a particular credential has been revoked. But you can't see the credential, you don't understand any data in the credential, but you can identify that this credential being presented to you actually has been revoked. Um, so there's not, there's not really 
and there's no there's no private data or encrypted data written to the blockchain. It's it's just things like public keys, it's URLs, it's DIDs, it's schemas, credential definitions. None of that is private or confidential or anything. So it just goes in the clear onto the onto the blockchain. Thank you. Yeah, that uh, very well explained it. Um, so you clearly the wallets are a big part of this, right? Yeah. Um, yep. You may even mentioned Apple kind of yep. potentially entering the space and such. So what stops us kind of immediately just falling in the same problem we had with OpenID Connect, where um, where basically it's just these big organizations just have all the data and you kind of just end up with the system with, with more <laughs> yeah, steps, it's, right? It's kind of circular, isn't it? Yeah, because you could then, if you use the Apple wallet, then all of a sudden they know all the credentials you're being issued and where you're um, <laughs> where you're presenting them and who's issuing to you're right. So yeah, you you're quite right that you you're giving over to Apple all that information. I mean, one solution to that is to use a third party wallet, like where we've built a wallet ourselves, and there's a Lissy wallet and there's an Evanim wallet and all those. And so you could use one of those, in which case you probably have more privacy that way because they're not going to report, you know, Evanim or Anonymous. So labs. We're not interested in what you do with your wallet. Uh, but you're quite right, like if you use a Google wallet or an Apple wallet and they're implementing credentials and things, which I expect them to do, um, yeah, they're, they're, there's an argument that you're you're helping them understand everything about you. Yeah. That's so yeah. Mm. so would, would the benefit here, though, still be that, because um, you've got the problem with the Open ID, Open ID Connect and uh, OAuth, where they have, where the actual implementer uh, had to actually connect with the uh, identity service or whatever I can't. That's quite. right. There's a there's there's a disconnection here between the identity service and the service provider. In like logically, there's always an identity provider, whereas you know where you've got your sort of your account and you give them some personal data. You've got the service provider that's providing the applications and the data. In the federated sense, you're creating a kind of a hard link between those two. In the DI sense, the fact that you've gone to Queensland Transport and got a credential, and then you've you know you've presented it over to the online you know beer store or wine store or whatever, there's no there's no connection between those two. Um, I mean, the wallet knows that you're issued from A and you presented it to B, and then I guess as you said, yeah, if you've used an Apple wallet, maybe Apple knows then. Um, but but you the issuer never knows when you're presented a, a credential to a verifier. It just doesn't know. So there is a big privacy benefit just by sep having a hard separation between the identity provider and the service provider. So talking about your, oh, sorry, go on. Oh, I can't hear that voice. Sly, your, your audio has dropped out. Mm. No, can't hear that. No. Uh, we might have to go back to another different question. Yeah. Yeah. It's not, not on mute, no? Sly, no. Uh, no, no, Sly, Sly your, if you can hear us, your audio is not working. Yep. Your microphone. Maybe another question in the meantime? Yeah, maybe. Uh, Hayden, just, go for it. Yeah, thanks. I don't want, I don't want to hog the room, so someone please um, uh, enter in if, if anyone else has any other questions. Mm -hmm. um, so clearly the wallet's a big thing here and stuff. Um, in terms of not using, so with Apple and stuff, they're clearly custodial services where, where Apple will, will hold that data and stuff. Are you similarly doing a custodial service or is there non-custodial? Um, no, so our, our um, app is a standalone app that lives on a, you know, iOS or an Android. Um, it uses this um, storage technology, well, this, there's, a, there's this kind of open source um, wallet technology called ASCA that we use um, as the fundamental you know, storage for, you know, things like your DINs and your credentials and all that. Um, but it's standalone on those mobile devices at the moment. One of the big questions we've got, right, so, it, it, you know, you install the app onto your mobile device and then you use it. So it's not, it's, not, it, it's, it's in the control of the user. One of the questions we do have, though, is for normals, like for normal people who, like, lose their phone and drop them in the river and they need a new phone and, like, how do they recover their wallet, right? And then you say, well, do we provide a backup? So we've been talking about, well, maybe we back up their wallet for them onto our servers or do they get it or do we say, you you know, you're in charge of your own wallet, you've got to back it up yourself to the iCloud or whatever. There's, there's always these problems. And so even just yesterday we were discussing, we haven't done it yet, but we're discussing, like, do we need 
to provide the option for a user to say, yeah, please back up my wallet to your cloud. And yeah, and they can encrypt it on their device and write it encrypted to our cloud. But still, it's like, uh, now we're now we're holding, you know, people's wallets and private keys and things like that. So I can yeah. say, I can say <laughs> from having tried to design these sorts of systems, Paul, that yeah. the weak point will be how to recover from I've lost my my house is burnt down. I've lost my mobile phone and my laptop and I don't remember my password to anonymy. <laughs> exactly right. Have, but I, I'm really me on a scout's honor. Yeah. Uh, and it's and and I mean there are ways around this. Like you can back up your like your, your mobile phone to your laptop. You can be backed up to things like iCloud and all that. So there are ways to protect yourself. The problem is the normal user that isn't really aware of backing up to their laptop or backing up to their cloud and, and they don't do it properly and then they drop their phone in the river and and then they've, as you said they've lost it it's hard yeah so we're, we're going through all those discussions so our first version of our wallet is just a standalone on the mobile and you you yeah you you're in charge of it yourself yeah thank you all right look Thank you very much, Paul, for a excellent talk. Um, and sorry for the interruption. Um, and for those who watch this online, you might find some minor edits towards the start of the um, the, the talk. But um, don't worry that that so that might delay the actual publication until tomorrow. Yeah. Uh, but not to worry. So thank you again, and a virtual clap from everyone, and a real one. Yeah, so thank you. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, thanks everyone. Yeah, it was it's good to be able to talk to you all, and 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 hopefully over the next few years we'll see decentralised identity appear in a lot more sort of block blockchain related projects. Yeah, for sure. Okay, talk thanks to everyone. everyone later. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you.